off. Um, I heard was it you first got into Diane Johnson? Was it when you heard his tapes was back, like way back, said like in the eighties when they were out? Is that the case? Yeah. Or yeah, I first heard Daniel. I would say it would probably be like eighty eighty five. I would say nineteen eighty five. Um, so it was around the time where you still sort of bootlegging those tapes and. Well, it wasn't a bootleg. It was a J- Jeff Tartikoff was um, had a cassette label called Stress Records. So if you were dialed into the independent underground fanzine community, okay. he would take out ads in the back of the fanzine. So this is all pre-internet. So that's, that was the only way that you would hear about uh, underground music. Because certainly mainstream publications, yeah, whether it be Mojo or Rolling Stone, they would never write about this. Yeah. As a matter of fact, they 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 openly showed disdain for this entire movement. Um, but anyway, so I sent off and I read about Daniel in one of the fanzines. I think it was called Chemical Imbalance, which was put out by a, a great uh, writer named, um, oh God, I'm forgetting his name right now, so I'll, 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 it'll come back to me. But anyway, right, so nice. I took off of the tapes in the mail. They were probably like $3 a pop. <laughs> And um, a stack of tapes showed up. It was probably Hi, How Are You? or Yip Jump Music or Songs of Pain. Maybe it was the What of Whom. Perhaps it was um, uh, Don't Be Scared, which was also known as Don't Be Scarred. So uh, so you got the sort of full collection of them all, sort of all just in the mail, is it? I'm, I probably did two batches. Everybody usually started off with either Hi, How Are You or Yip Jump Music. That's sort of how it was. That was your introduction. Both very solid ways to learn about Daniel. Yeah, then you would double back into the other tapes, like Songs of Pain or More Songs of Pain. Um, but anyway, so what was, what, was, what was most fascinating about those tapes um, was that they were being distributed so cheaply that they were... Uh, Daniel invented what became known as lo-fi. So not only were the tapes on cassettes, but his master tapes were recorded on cassettes on these two little Radio Shack homemade tape recorders with really bad microphones mm-hmm. in a garage in his brother's uh, house in outside of Houston, Texas. So these tapes had a lot of <laughs> on them. So you have to like sort of squint your ears to hear uh, the magic of the songs, the poetry, the primitive music, and you also got to stare at the artwork, which had this great, this great line art that Daniel was drawing. So it was all of the above. But there was one little bonus on all the tapes. All right. It was that he, he had recorded his mom yelling at him <laughs> between the songs. So you get this uh, what we call audio verite, and you got a glimpse into his life with his mom's uh, rants you know, yelling at him and calling him a total loser. Most of these rants were quite religious. Uh, she was a staunch fundamentalist Christian. And that was quite an entertaining piece of uh, audio and visual to get for $3 back in 1985. I'd say definitely. Um, I think, yeah, that's, that's one of the things like, I remember hearing. It seemed like the sort of they were available so cheaply and Daniel just used to like almost sort of hand them out. Like he said, I heard he was sort of handing them out to people on the street or, you know, when people would order stuff from McDonald's, he'd give, you know, he'd give his tapes. It just seemed like sort of any and which every way that he could to get it out there it was sort of, and sort of spread it amongst sort of the masses. He'd sort of try, try and do that, it seemed, from what I heard. Well, it's all true. Back in Austin, Texas, when he was, you know, essentially living in a closet, he was uh, saved by the Church of Christ. He, he had gone mad. And then he got a job at McDonald's, not even being the French fry boy, but actually sweeping and cleaning. And you can see footage of that in the film. But what was really great was he, he invented what is now called, you know, like viral marketing or guerrilla marketing. He had, he had such confidence in his work that he would be dubbing and dubbing and dubbing these cassettes, which of course were, were, they were very cheap. And if you were a hip looking, you know, musician or a cute girl in Austin and you're at McDonald's, you would get a surprise in your sack with your hamburger and fries. It was a tape by Daniel Johnston. So uh, he, he put them into a few key people's uh, french fry sacks. They went home and listened to them. And 
instantly there was uh, chatter and talk and gossip about who is this guy because uh, the music was so unique. That I remember, like, sort of following on from that, I remember hearing was it that you got the idea, or like, sort of, you felt like that you wanted to do a film about Daniel. Was it after you heard the a radio show that he put out like, while he was in that mental hospital during during the nineties? Yeah, uh, basically. Times, so when you... Yeah, I can elaborate on that. Um, so basically, um, I'd become a fan, and I started following his story. Because he could, he didn't tour, you know. If you didn't, if you weren't in Austin, you never got to see him. So there was a lot of great fans in the Hoboken, New Jersey, New York City area. This whole underground community of people: um, Sonic Youth, Yola Tango, Jad Fair, half Japanese. We're all living in Hoboken. I was living in Hoboken. Everybody was living around this Maxwell's Club scene. That's why we all moved there. To, to we were all part of the underground music community. Some people were filmmakers, some people were artists, some people were writers, some people were musicians, some were all of the above. And um, Daniel's rap had really grown. The greatest thing about him was that he didn't tour, that you couldn't meet him, greet him, touch him, hear him. It was just a, a myth that was being built through the audio. And he would be making the news. So there were magazines like the New York Free Press, the Village Voice, were covering his life. And you'd hear these incredible things, and yeah. you'd know if it was true or not. And then the stories would get passed around, like the game of telephone, and sometimes they were quite exaggerated. And we didn't know what was real or not. So by the time he made this album, which was titled 1990, which was produced by the great producer Kramer, um, it was like Daniel Johnston mania in the underground. So he, and he knew it. He had gotten his first real album recorded. The other cassettes were real albums, but this was the first time anyone put them in a studio. And uh, that album became the soundtrack to The Devil and Daniel Johnson. All the key songs come from that album. It's, it's you know, I don't want to use the M word too loosely, but it truly is a masterpiece. Um, anyway, to promote the album, WFMU, which to this day is the greatest underground radio station freeform in the United States, uh, all the DJs, some of which are still my friends, are, were way on board. We're going to promote this record. And um, Daniel decided, like Orson Welles, to do a special radio broadcast because Daniel was great at producing what we call radio dramas. So he whipped up a one-hour special to be on Nick Hill's Radio Faucet, and he produced it on his two cassette decks, and it was being broadcast live, or we were led to believe this, from the mental hospital in West Virginia, which is kind of amazing that he's in a hallway on a payphone <laughs> broadcasting this self-produced uh, Orson Welles-like War of the World's radio drama all about his mania of being famous, and it's even scarier as a listener to know he's doing it from the mental home because when you hear what's coming out of his mouth, you're just like, wow, this guy's the real deal. Yes, he should be locked away. He needs help. But boy, is it entertaining. So you're not laughing at him, I assure you, because he's laughing at himself. He knows what's going on. and He's exploiting his own mental illness. He knows that people want to pay attention to him because he's the crazy artist. He knows about Van Gogh. He's willing to chop off his own ear for fame because he doesn't want fame for fame's sake. He's done the work. He's written the hundreds of songs. He's made the art, but he needs the hook. He knows he needs the hook to, for people to pay attention. So he's all of the above. He's like Andy Warhol, you know, painting all day, but going out at night and looking for patrons. You know, he's not a shy artist that's sitting in his garage and saying to people, you know, what do you think of my art? He's not shy. Okay, he's out there, and he's in your face. And it puts a lot of people off, actually. But the people who get it uh, become rabid fans like myself. And they become incredibly moved by this art. You know, a lot of the thematic uh, imagery and the subject matter is all of uh, songs of unrequited love. A lot of, you know, something that most of us can relate to. Or it's about his own mental illness, which is really honest and open and painful and tragic and poignant to listen to. So there's a lot there for people to chew on. Mm. Yeah, definitely. I think sort of like 
one of the things that definitely like sort of like when you mentioned sort of Van Gogh there that I don't know who it was that um, like sort of some that you had sort of footage from during the film is sort of saying that whole sort of thing about you know the troubled artist and they're saying you know if um, like sort of what happens like you know say like Van Gogh you know should should they be sort of you know should they need help you know or do you just sort of let them loose and sort of create their sort of art and like I said like it's interesting sort of that I guess sort of what's your view on it I guess now sort of in terms of what the film sort of sort of explored that sort of idea of you know that whole sort of that sort of the stereotype that you have of like you know the troubled artist and you know that we don't really know as listeners or you know as, as viewers sort of what what's sort of behind behind the sort of creative process the sort of like the struggles that maybe the artist might have like Daniel you know who speaks so candidly I guess about you know his own experiences yeah, well, you know, I never pretended to be an expert on manic depression no, and mental course, illness yeah. and genius, but I did have a thesis back then, and this is really the early years, if you remember, recall, it wasn't easy to just go to the doctor and get some pills, and I, and, and I have strong opinions one way or the other about whether to medicate or not medicate, and people still struggle with that, but I read this book, which is in the film, by Kay Redfield Jameson, who suffered from manic depression. And it's called Touched with Fire. And she chronicled all the great writers, poets, painters, musicians, artists throughout history. And they all suffered from the exact same thing that Daniel suffered from. So my thesis was that manic depression, bipolar disorder, is the great blessing and curse of artists. Um, the blessing is we get all this incredible art. The tragedy is that these people have to suffer so greatly to create it. So, you know, that's where I stand on that, and I think Daniel falls right into that, that, you know, great list of people that, you know, we write books about and make documentaries and see movies about, you know, these incredible yeah. artists that had it. And I don't want to judge it one way or the other, it just is. So. Yeah, definitely. I think sort of one of the things that I thought was like that obviously like Daniel Johnson's like he seems to have a life that just lends itself almost perfectly to sort of being on film like he's had you know all these sort of amazing sort of experiences like sort of ridiculous sort of events that have happened to him but I guess sort of a new like sort of was it important to you sort of like almost that you made I felt like almost like you got in there first before sort of someone made a film that sort of over dramatized you know the sort of like rather than sort of being a portrait of sort of Daniel's life it was more just you know oh, you know, plane crash, you know, he attacked someone, you know, all that sort of stuff that he didn't really get at the essence of what Daniel was about, you know. Well, you know, there was many people who tried to make films about Daniel before me. Um, they all failed. Oh, really? um, but they all gave me their footage. So, and it was footage, and I used their footage. And, of course, I shot a great deal of my own footage. Mm. But um, I felt like I had a grasp on his, his story. He had an incredible story. I always thought it was a movie as I was following it for so many years and keeping a folder mm -hmm. on these events. And, you know, in, 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 there's nothing exploitive about the facts. The facts are the facts. He did crash a plane thinking he was cast for the friendly ghost and almost killed his dad. It, it happened. Mm -hmm. So this is a story that has to be told. The question is, how do you tell it? Yeah. And I tried to tell it as... Uh, well, I mean, my love for Daniel and his art, I hope, comes through in the film. I'm not exploiting his madness. He was great at exploiting his madness all on his own without me mm -hmm. for many, many years. And a lot of people, you know, criticize um, the Maisels for, like, Grey Gardens. They called it, oh, it's exploitive. But I don't believe that. So my whole rule was uh, nothing is exploitive. Anything is fair as long as you're seeking a deeper truth. So my whole trip is not is a new journalism, and that's what I was trying to do in film with my favorite type of writing, which is new journalism. Things like Tom Wolfe and Norman Mailer and um, Nick Toshis and some of my other literary heroes. Uh, as long as you're seeking a deeper truth, there's no there's no boundaries, there's no rules, there's no there's no uh, you don't know, censor yourself. Yeah. So and I, so I did I tried to do that with Daniel, and I, I hope I was fair. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think that's definitely sort of like one thing that sort of comes through, sort of I guess over the course of the film that it seems to sort of been made sort of completely just with sort of love for Daniel, both as an artist and his work and like as a person. I think you know. 
Yeah, I mean, that's very real. That's how I felt about him and his art and his work. I thought it was a great tragedy that the world had not really heard of him outside of the underground. Mm. And I really wanted to share this special person who fell through the cracks, who was definitely, you know, maligned as just a footnote in music and art history. And um, I thought it was unfair, and it had to be an independent film that was going to tell the world about him. Uh, the mass media certainly was never going to do it. Mm. And, you know, the, the great thing that came out of all of this is that here we are talking about this film, was it like 10 years later now? Mm. 2005, right? Yeah. Uh, here we are, it's shown all over the world, and all these new people, young people, have been turned on to Daniel and his art. And now Daniel is not some homeless, mentally ill person on the streets, which is how he would have ended up. He, he makes a real honest living off of his art, off of his music, all around the world today, and that's fantastic. So I, I couldn't be happier for the outcome for, for this person that I, you know, whose art I love dearly. Yeah, definitely. It seems like sort of that almost like, it was almost like sort of like a turning point or sort of like a springboard for Daniel, because it seems like sort of, like just the wealth of projects that he seems to like sort of have sort of going on now, you know, with his different sort of comic books being published and more films coming out and sort of more albums and it's sort of growing a growing collection with sort of each one of more people sort of being aware of it you know I think sort of since since the film definitely well you know I mean I really I said it then I'll say it now I these artists like Daniel Johnston they don't grow on trees you probably don't have one in your neighborhood I know I don't have another one in my neighborhood it's not like there's a hundred Daniel Johnstons out there these are very very rare people and the body of work is just, it's breathtaking. You know, you'll see it in my film when you pull back on that heart and see all those cassettes. Oh, yeah. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of hours of material. This isn't a guy who wrote a couple songs and couldn't do it again. You know, and this isn't a guy who made, you know, 25 paintings. We're talking about thousands of, of uh, drawings and paintings that are all over the world. And he came up with his own distribution system. How did it get out there? It's unbelievable. And I think, you know, there'll be a museum show when he's dead one day. There'll be a place just like the Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh. I think he is the great artist of, uh, of his times. I, I, I don't think it's hyperbole when I say that. And, I, and I, you know, he worked, at, once again, he was, he was a great director. You see that in his Super 8 films. Mm. He was a great comedian, you know. He has an incredible sense of humor. It's not just visual art. It's not just music. You know, he worked in radio, radio drama. Uh, this is a guy who everything he touches, you know, comic books like you were saying right now, everything he touches is gold. And I don't know of another artist like that. I mean, there's one other artist I feel like that, that is of his stature that, that walks the earth today. And it's, it's uh, from, uh, from Chatham, England, uh, Billy Childish. He's the only other artist I think that measures up to Daniel Johnston, who's the real deal. Hmm. Yeah, I think um, I love that you're saying like about that, like sort of like sort of Daniel sort of being unique and sort of like it's not even just sort of the person; it's like almost like the whole environment that he grew up in, and it's sort of like that there could never be sort of anyone else just like him. You know, he's had of he sort of came out of this, you know, very sort of strict sort of you know religious sort of family, and he's had sort of all these like ridiculous sort of like life experiences and I know sort of like some people saying oh you know oh Daniel would have been okay or he wouldn't have been the sort of person he was you know maybe if his parents didn't force sort of religion on him but it's almost like all these different aspects of him sort of make Daniel sort of the person that he is you know and that he is just, just that sort of one of a kind individual that it lends itself to that kind of art I think yeah well you know once again I think the better term I don't like calling him an outsider artist and and, and he's unfortunately been categorized mm. as that and I think that will change over time he's a visionary artist a lot of uh, his work with the religious symbolism that he works with of good versus evil and how he channels that into the superheroes uh, of his comic books and then the characters that he's invented I think it's visionary art um, and that, that only could have come from the influences of the deep religious stuff that his mom and dad and his family, uh, you know, brought him up on, forced on him, however you want to call it. Uh, it's a great cocktail. And then when you combine that with his manic depression, and uh, you couldn't 
it's like, it's like a test tube. It's like the, the ingredients that went into the recipe of Daniel Johnston created a unique cake, you know, and, and it, you can't recreate it. No. Uh, and it'd be tougher to recreate now with the Internet, to be honest with you, because of mass culture. So there's a bit of a vacuum and a bubble in the hills of wild West Virginia. And at the same time, he was still, as a young boy, obsessed with, you know, things like the Beatles and Bruce Springsteen and all these other great songwriters, Neil Young, things like that. He was getting all that. And he was getting Woody Allen and getting Jerry Lewis and getting all these things that I loved. You know, we're about the same age. But he, you know, put it all together and this is what we got. You know, all this great art. That's what we get out of this, you know. Yeah, definitely. I suppose, like, one, one of the other things that I was thinking was, um, like, having sort of just mentioned sort of his parents there, I guess sort of, what was it like sort of, I guess, you know, going going to the Johnsons and sort of filming with them? Because it seems to me it's sort of that, like the sort of the art world and sort of all the people that Daniel had met and sort of out, it just seems so incredibly distant from, I guess, you know, their sort of very sort of quiet rural upbringing that his sort of parents had. So I guess in terms of how they were receptive to you, I guess, sort of coming in and sort of filming and sort of trying to sort of amass all the sort of footage or having access to all their sort of family tapes, I guess. Yeah, well, you know, when I had met them, they and the family were still very, very skeptical of Daniel. He wasn't earning a living, I assure you. So they were very skeptical of his music and art. And the only validation that they acknowledged at that point in time was all the fan letters. Like they, were, they, they did understand that it was, there was a certain group of people, a small amount, that really deeply appreciated his work. And they loved that. They thought that was really great. The idea that it was that it actually had value and it was great in and of itself, I would say it was a bit of a stretch for them. They, they did come to that later. Mm -hmm. Although the dad was very, very proud of his drawing. It was more about the drawing than the music. The music, I think, they thought was <laughs> worthless. The brother certainly felt that way. But the drawings, the, the dad proudly displayed his art around the house and was very, very proud of his art. Now, that art was not selling, and it mm -hmm. certainly wasn't in galleries uh, until after the film came out. So when I found the art and the notebooks, you know, we're talking stacks and stacks of notebooks of art, and lost songs and drawings and flip books and animations. You know, when I found that stuff, it was literally in the garage, you know, under the leaf blower and the dripping oil cans, rotting. And, and then all those films, the Super 8, was being eaten by mold in a closet. This was not valuable stuff to this family. Stuff was all, hundreds of cassettes just throwing garbage bags strewn all around the garage. So I rescued that stuff. And then ironically, when the film was completed, we did a big gallery show in New York for the premiere. You know, that stuff was literally under glass <laughs> in a gallery show. And it was like amazing. So I feel like it was like an excavation and we saved it for our history. So Yeah, I'd imagine sort of like just like just seeing just like the well are you right? So um, I say like it seems like just like just the wealth of footage. It's almost like I'd say as a filmmaker, it must almost be like just like a treasure trove, you know, sort of like just how much that has been recorded. It's like you know, he just seemed to record obsessively. Yeah, it it, it was a treasure trove. It was ma a massive excavation. I can't begin to tell you the hours. How long it took? I'd say just going through. Oh, I went through it all myself. I transcribed it all. I would sit there with headphones and just transcribe and transcribe and transcribe. And it was the happiest time of my life, perhaps, because I, I love to work, so it kept me quite busy. And, um, you know, the film had to eventually end and be completed, and I had to just say, all right, it's done. Yeah. But there's a lot of great material that didn't make it into the film, because it had to be about an hour and 50 minutes, the film's length it is right now. It's still, you know, it's quite a long documentary. Mm -hmm. But... We were trying to, we thought it was an epic tale and it needed epic length and epic handling and that's what we tried to do, me and my producer, Henry Rosenbaum, who, who uh, produced the film. So, uh, yeah, it was a massive undertaking. Dublin, right? Yeah. Okay, here we go. <laughs> uh, whoever you are in Dublin who came out tonight to see The Devil and Daniel Johnson, maybe it's the first time you're going to see the film. Maybe you've seen it before and you brought some friends. Um, it's... Super cool that you came out tonight. Um, I'm thrilled to share this film with you and Daniel with you. And, you know, after the film's over, if Daniel and his art or music touches you, I highly recommend that you check out his recordings. 
there's hours of listening pleasure there, or maybe buy some art or whatever it is that you want to do with this. Because as an artist, it's a really fun trip to spend some time with. It's sort of like Dylan. You know, you can spend months and months of your life and getting a lot of pleasure out of this guy's work. I certainly have, and I hope I hope you enjoy the movie.